Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Apollinario Carina, uh, who's going to talk to us about the impacts of rainforest farming today. Thank you, Apollinario. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Quite short and brief. Um, this afternoon, I'll be sharing a story about this rainforest station farming that we did in Negros Oriental, and particularly sharing some of its impacts to the wildlife that we wanted to conserve um, in the province or in the Philippines overall. Um, together with my colleagues, these are all farmers, Vinny Vindiola and Rico Mayer, the president of the Federation, would like to say thank you for coming over. Should I speak in the vernacular, Tagalog or English? Because I saw a lot of Filipinos. <laughs> Only very few are English speakers. Anyway, just kidding aside, um, Pinagmanaki stands for the Federacion sa Nakay Usang Mga Maguuma nga Nanalipo Dung Nagpasigili sa Kinayan Incorporated. In English, that means a federation of farmers that uh, protects and rehabilitates the environment. And practically, that's the vision of the organization. So as we all know, the Philippines is a tropical country. And we're quite happy for that one. And the Philippines is considered one of the mega diverse countries in the world for its high species richness and endemism. And that is something we are supposed to be proud of. However, it faces a lot of challenges towards these opportunities. Um, in an archipelagic country where only less than 18% of its forest cover is left, along with a number of catastrophic events, has caused a very sluggish economy to the country. This has been coupled with more political influences rather than um, initiatives for sustainable development. Our people have never learned, thus really became so unprepared to any of the natural catastrophic events that struck the Philippines. Now, um, this avalanche cost um, 1,106 uh, individuals who died Almost the entire village was covered in Ginza Ogon, Southern Leyte. And another incident, um, this was in 2012, the tropical storm Sendong brought heavy rainfall to the province of Negros Oriental and affected most of the communities that we worked with. And this flooding cost around 69 people died during this event. Another um, event that happened, this is the recent um, earthquake that struck a magnitude of 6.9 in the northern part of uh, Negros that almost damaged of most of the provincial roads connecting to the other side of the province towards the north. Yet this since continued unabated from uh, slash and burn farming to small scale illegal logging and many other threats to biodiversity. Sugarcane plantations played a important role in the, the destruction of our forests and continued, it continued encroaching most of our forest lands all over the island. Three years ago, the Jetrofa and cassava plantations were initiated by a politician for biofuel but failed its production for some environmental factors. And it just created a big debt with the Development Bank of the Philippines, of which the Filipino people is paying. It also therefore created massive insurgency issues in the areas we worked with. Uh, motorbikes replaced the old fashion of carrying lugs. Uh, the ones we used to know, the carabao lugging, is now converted to uh, motorcycle lugging and will soon be sold to lumber yards without any permits at all. Charcoal making is also widespread all throughout the island due to massive increased demand in the food grilling business in all major cities of the two provinces. This has been coupled with wildlife poaching and trading and hunting either for bushmeat or pet. Since 1999, this has been the configuration of the country's forest cover, but I'm pretty sure this has even reduced further nowadays. To date, the country has the status of our endemic wildlife through IUCN definitions. The figures may look very nice because it has high figures, 
but they're not. It is alarming. However, there are still hopes left for our wildlife on Negros. Through our research, we learned that we still have these threatened species surviving in our forest patches. These are some of the threatened herpetofaunal species on the southeastern part of Negros Island. And these are some of the birds, threatened birds, also recorded on the side of our island. And these are some of the mammals, threatened mammals, that can be observed uh, on our side. These are some of the interesting flowering plants, um, aside from the highly prized and threatened diptera trees in our forests. And to sum it up, in summary at least, we have still this number of opportunities to be saved from extinction. So we have more than 180 of non and diptera species of trees, and 23 among these species are threatened. Among the 49 reported amphibians and reptiles, we have at least eight species that are threatened. And among the 113 species of birds, um, at least 13 are globally threatened and are still surviving in the site. Among the 23 species of mammals recorded in the area, more than 50% are threatened species. So this is the question, why we conserve the forests of Negros? Well, we have thousands of reasons that we can always think of, but let's understand first why this happened. So before the coming of Spanish colonizers, 95% of Negros was forested. And the first invasion of the island's forest was the introduction of the sugar industry in 1850. The second invasion came in 1905 and commercial logging was introduced by the American Insular Lumber Company in Northern Negros. Then in 1960, Ilco moved down south with a logging concession of 60,000 hectares. That was the major cause why most of our forest down south has been removed dramatically. The fourth was the introduction of large-scale mining also down south, so meaning these are the portions that the mining areas really moved and dispersing many of the settlers. In just little over a century, the original forest cover of Necos declined from 95% to a meagerly 4%. So, one of the contributing factors that inhibit forest denudation is the increase also of the population. We don't have the RHD yet at this time. So the graph above uh, shows simply that as the population increased by the number, okay, 2.8 million people at that time, um, the forest cover has also decreased. So in order to conserve and protect these species and their habitat, the Mount Alinis Twin Lakes Biodiversity Conservation Project, uh, supported by the Foundation for the Philippine Environment, was established through the assistance of the Siliman University Center for Tropical Conservation Studies. That was in 1994. Then during its project implementation, we realized that through the rainforestation technology, which is a family-based enterprise and ownerships were recognized and practiced by the community members, of which we never failed to believe and implement. So the objective is very simple, um, and that is to showcase rainforestation simply through the establishment of demonstration plots, allowing more people from neighboring communities to be enticed in replicating the initiative. At the same time, providing opportunities for livelihood and wildlife to recover. Now, what is rainforestation farming? According to Milan and Mark Graf, um, this is a technology that develops farming system that resembles closely the structure of a natural um, Philippine rainforest ecosystem or home gardens that promotes the use of native or local trees rather than the exotic trees as earlier promoted by the government. It also aims to replace the more destructive form of kainin or slash and burn farming practice and form a buffer zone around primary forests and help protect local biodiversity. It also helps maintain the water cycle and other ecological services of the forest and finally provide farmers a stable and high income and is a strategy to mitigate climate change. This is the schematic illustration, by the way, of how pioneering as well as the climax tree species are planted one year after the other including the inclusion of some commercially important uh, fruiting trees to augment farmers' livelihood uh, income. 
So, um, although the objective sounds simple, but the methods are quite tricky and needs a lot of serious implementation. First, capacity building play a vital role in the implementation processes before the actual reinforestation implementation that includes site inventory and selection, nursery establishment, um, seed and widening collection, growth chamber construction, and outplanting. In this initiative, by the way, uh, we were able to make some innovations that, that is during outplanting, a combination of pioneer and climax tree species were employed or were planted. Monitoring and evaluation also played a very significant role in the process and the promotion of such initiative through networking and linkage. So the initiatives were done um, along the sites, including the areas of the Palinsasia Twin Lakes Natural Park, along with uh, four local government units, Bakung, Valencia, and uh, Manhuyut. And four families or individuals also implemented it down in the north, which is Gihulngan, Bindoy, Bayawan, and Shatun. So, how did it start it, by the way? Its humble beginning started when um, five members of the Federation went or sent to Visaya State College, now Visaya State University, in 2005. A year after that, Rene Vendiola started a one hectare rainforest engine farm in Liptong, Baco. And uh, during that time, Rico Mayer, a year after that, initiated a 15 hectare rainforest station farm, which is purely indigenous trees in the protected area because no one can introduce um, exotic fruit trees out there. And then myself, we need to walk the talk, you know, and exercise that in, in 2008. So I established after purchasing a one hectare farmland just beside Rene Vindiola's place. So this is the um, documentation started in 2005 where he, Rene Vindiola started by making a nursery and then this one was the staking, where we initially started planting in the 2006. Then we have the monitoring and the rearing of these plants in year two, as well as year three. We started uh, to remove some of the weeds. These are the only thing that needs maintenance during this time. However, in year four, you don't need a lot of maintenance anymore. You just leave it alone. And year 2010, we started to come up with some thinning, removing some of the unwanted branches or some of the trees that competes with the others. Now in year 2011, um, the facility now um, became a hub for many students and visitors interested in, in the project. And at present, the tree seedlings planted somehow looks like a secondary forest already and has this 60% canopy showing up already up in the camp. So this is actually the main entrance of the farm. We managed to put up a little something in there, a sign. Now, we named it Lipton Woodlands after or following the name of its barangay, previously known to have an abundance of this tree called Lipton. Lipton is, by the way, from the genus Palacium, Sorsugunense, um, as depicted from the flower of, of this logo. And the rest of the supporters down below. So, um, impacts to livelihood. First, I'm gonna share to you this because this is something that is really important to be replicated and to be known to everyone. Um, Rene Vindiola's income raised um, dramatically. We have at least $200 per year for ornamentals and coconuts. And that starts from year 2006 to 2009. And he also earned at least $525 um, starting in 2008 until the present for the fruits of Lansones. And he also earns $1,500 at least for the seedling production that he was able to sold and sell. Um, he receives a regular $100 incentives from bird guiding um, because the facility is now becoming popular for bird guiding and uh, bird watching rather. And an accountable subsistence uh, uh, results from his cash crops coming from yams, rambutans, pineapples, bananas, and some other fruit trees. 
for vertebrate fauna or in, rea in general for the wildlife, um, it increased dramatically from 500% for the birds. We have more than 25 species now of birds recorded in the area. And it has been the feeding area for many species of birds, bats and bees and butterflies. Nesting habitat for some species of birds. We have at least a number of these birds. We have more than five species of insect bats now recorded in the area and uh, seven species of fruit bats. And literally the barangay considered the area as a barangay privately owned wildlife sanctuary. As we started to notice and observe the sudden increase of our wild visitors in the demonstration plots, some of our bird watching friends or birders as they like to be called noticed this species. So in uh, two years ago, um, the seventh wild bird club uh, of the Philippines tried to uh, come up with a festival in, in our city, hosted by Dumaguete as well as the provinces of Negros Oriental and our organization. So <clears throat> um, it provided the participants with an easy access to the endemic species of birds just a few minutes away from the city, where they can see these birds up close and personal at the garden. Like this endemic coleto trying to build a nest in one of the dead trees in the garden. And this was photographed, caught in the act while feeding um, in the uh, fruits of the Medinilia magnifica. This is a vulnerable endemic species of bird, flower pecker. And the participants were also able to observe a nesting couple of endemic negros cups owl while the male is seen sleeping during the day. Both were actively taking turns finding food for their chicks in the evening. As in this case, the female, as the female to the right is already about to feed the chicks with a lizard on its beak. Just recently, we were able to document, although seen once only, and in solitary, the critically endangered necros feeding heart pigeon that fed on the fallen fruits of pinanga and heterospathy palms planted in the farm. So these are palm fruits that were um, fed by this bird. So more and more birds were documented at this point. Now as you look around down the leaf litters, you'll be so lucky to see some hopping creatures like these endemic frogs trying to secure themselves from the fallen leaves whilst the sailfin lizard is documented basking under the sun with some common fruit bats. Um, tent roosting, these are some of the fruit bats. This is the small, the short-nosed fruit bat um, that roost, uh, happily roosting in, in this um, front of an anahau plant. So we also observed some um, interesting species like this rhinolophid bat, um, the long-eared rhinolophus. And two unidentified evening and horseshoe bats. The garden is now a frequent uh, visitor of this smallest uh, flying fox in the Philippines called the little golden mantled flying fox. And this large flying fox, the biggest in terms of wingspan in the world, has been observed hovering every night and sometimes accidentally made the garden its delivery room as her newly delivered pup um, was busy suckling for milk. So more and more species of butterflies, uh, moths, bees, right, these are the bees, ant houses, um, and even fungi added colors to the garden. To date, a total of five local government units um, and several committees already adopted the technology and approximately 392 hectares have been reforested or reforested all throughout the province. Several other LGUs or local government units, individuals or families and industrial companies, including NGOs, are also soliciting for our technical assistance in establishing similar initiatives in their areas. Now this slide shows the initial uh, number of species per taxa recorded in Lipton Woodlands only. 
So as you can see, we have a dramatic increase of uh, more species of birds, um, the reptiles and amphibians, including the mammalian fauna. For plants, these are just planted directly. So we introduce the plants in the area, all of them. Through our advocacy and influence shown in the local government unit of Valencia, the LGU established its own municipal indigenous tree nursery in preparation for the communities of Valencia in the watershed areas to utilize for free. So the LGU itself uh, produced this and spent a lot of money for this for free to be used by the communities around the watershed areas. Now, Tata Larry Escalante, one of the PO leaders in my federation, um, started implementing the family-initiated uh, tree nursery of fruits and other indigenous trees. He earned at least $3,700 uh, annually starting in 2006. And, um, but we have several issues and problems. Um, we met some challenges, and we were able to identify most of them, including uh, issues and concerns on monitoring and evaluation, particularly in the documentation and reporting, as well as publication of the results. The financial management is also becoming an issue. Awareness, campaigns, and innovation of mitigating measures were also another issue. So here are some of the lessons learned and outcomes generated by the initiative. As we showcase the mixture of framework and climax tree species, this provided opportunities for fire succession to be short-circuited. Most of the dipter cap trees planted perform so well in the open areas of the demonstration farm. And after three years, most of the weeds were already um, shaded out. Framework species planted also served as food plants for many species of seed dispersing animals like birds and fruit bats, allowing more seedlings produced in the ground cover. And the initiative also provided opportunities as income generating where these seedlings were sold to other reforestation activities. The introduction of understory plant species such as palms, araceae, tree ferns, medinelia species, heliconias, and other epiphytes during the third year of implementation allowed a better replica of the original forest that also provided opportunities for other wildlife species like insects bats, birds, frogs, lizards, and snakes to feed on the nectars of its flowers, the fruits, and prey that were recruited in the area. The planting also of Montilla calabra, uh, or manzanitas in Espanol, in buffer or strategic areas prevented some species of fruit bats from attacking the fruiting lanzones and rambutan along the farm. Now, this is Good, because we were awarded by UNDP, Equator Initiative, in 2006, and it provided wider and better opportunities for us, and an excellent to respect our organization in our province, as well as in the entire country overall. Tata Irene Benjola also received the fifth Ramona Boitis Foundation Incorporated Award um, for an exemplary individual in the field of environment. He was a former hunter, a caininero, now turned conservationist. And that's a good story to tell. And he was awarded um, two years ago. Tata Irene's uh, fifth Ramon Abortistanian Award for example, in the world proved that not only professional people can also receive the award, but farmers like him can make a change and be recognized nationally, along with uh, last, uh, the other year's past winner in the organization category. So this is the winner for the individual, and the other one is for the organization category. Now, part of his award was to purchase this mini truck to help transport and deliver seedlings to many awaiting partners all over the island and some other neighboring islands, because we now started to travel in Cebu, Panay, as well as some parts of Mindanao. So it's getting more widespread now. We don't have internet access, we don't have websites, but Word of mouth in the Philippines is very much more effective. So finally, we can simply say that what we do today will be the heritage for the future generation. And I hope you who, um, you like that presentation. This somehow gives us a little uh, positive move for the Philippines to work on into something like this all throughout the country. 
but we wish to thank also these people and these organizations who in one way or another provided support for us in general. And uh, thank you very much for your presence especially and for listening. I can now entertain some questions. Yes. And then at the Ate. Yes, usually farmlands or farmers um, not being productive enough. And my other question is, do you plan to deal with the farmers, even though you have the farmers in the farm as well? Right. Do you plan to deal with the farmers as well? Six years at least. So between crossing here and coming to the city, you know? Right. And how do you plan to deal with So we certainly do not want to cut most of the activities of the farmers. This is just to augment their livelihood, existing ones. But later on, as the rainforestation progresses, they should stop some of those activities. But during the first three years, cash crops are planted. That's why I mentioned the uh, yams, all those sweet potatoes. We also have bananas and so on. Um, we also discusses on something like uh, the planting of ornamental plants that created a lot of revenues for him. He started uh, planting orchids as well as anthoriums that are quite obviously um, uh, available and uh, easy to, to sell in, in the market in, in our city. As well as the heliconias that was planted, it creates huge massive amount of uh, revenues for the farmers. So these four years, you have to discuss this with the farmer practically to assure that the farmer can still provide food for the table and not literally being absent for the next six years. Thank you so much. I can address the, I think I, I heard two questions, two major questions, like the monitoring issue. This is, has been our main issue as well. We had some difficulty because the farmers don't care of noting down all those things. What they want to care about is the revenues right away, money. So we take care of those things, like the monitoring and stuff. The documentation side was quite hard for me because we don't have any funds on that part. However, um, we trained some of the farmers to do the monitoring. We were able to come up with a free training from the Environmental Leadership Training Initiative by Yale University and come up with a very simple methods of monitoring. And that might be presented later on in the next WIN conference, probably. The second question was um, regarding the issue on farmers also uh, creating those sugarcane plantations. Winnie Vindiola has a 50 hectare lot in one of the uh, forest land areas in Seattle. And he has a 20 hectare sugarcane plantation. Now he cuts down the 10 hectares by showing also another demonstration plot there in Seattle of a rainforest station. Um, so his existing 50 hectare lot is now converted to at least 10 hectare rainforestation in Seattle. Now, our strategy is to entice people and specifically just to invite more people and say, hey, this works. So if you earn at least 100,000 pesos for or meagerly $2,000 of sugarcane revenues every year, then you can somehow you know, compete with these results if we convert that into a rainforestation farm. And that is becoming more effective. Now the province is now listening to us. We now become one of the reactors of, of the provincial 
um, reforestation uh, ordinance that the province created last year. So we incorporated the technology to that ordinance and hopefully this year we will be implementing more of this because our governor who was our governor elect also won this election. So we're quite happy for that one. Yes, Eileen, thank you. looking at the person right beside me here, the, the person in eyeglasses. Well, we've been starting to discuss about that, but there are some issues concerning the priorities of red. Um, but that's one of the possibilities. There is a huge parcel of land actually that I have presented to Kuya Alvin here some time a year ago that there is a huge vacant lot there somewhere in the central most part. As you can see with the map, we only have that little dot of forest covered down southeastern side of the island. So we've been discussing that possibility as well. But I think that the more relevant issue is that perhaps for the group can look at it from uh, an island-wide perspective rather than a small portion of red Yeah, that's right. An island view. <laughs> that's a that uh, that's a good or a huge challenge. Over. Thank you.